Hi, everyone. Welcome to Unconfirmed, the podcast that reveals how the marquee names in crypto are reacting to the week's top headlines and gets the inside scoop on what they see on the horizon. I'm your host, Laura Shin. Unchained and Unconfirmed are now published as videos. If you're not yet subscribed to the Unchained YouTube channel, head to youtube.com slash C slash Unchained podcast and subscribe today. Heads up, as you may recall, we did a survey to find out what you all want from the show. Thanks to everyone who took the time to take our survey. We now have the winners of the contest for our survey respondents to win the Crypto.com Metal MCO Visa cards. They are Thomas Schwartz, Caleb, Forrest, Anonymous, Herbert Blasingale, Ammon Bingham, Tim Lane, Antoine Vu, Amit Chala, and Katie Mayo. Thanks to everyone who answered the questions in our survey and congrats to our winners. Crypto.com is waiving the 3.5% credit card fee for all crypto purchases. Download the Crypto.com app today. Need cash but don't want to sell your crypto? Use Nexo's instant crypto credit lines and withdraw funds today. Starting from only 5.9% APR. Create an account at nexo.io. Today's guest is Ben Sellermeyer, Index Manager at Coinmetrics. Welcome, Ben. Thank you, Laura, for having me. This week, Coinmetrics came out with a new metric that addresses a tricky issue with crypto assets, especially when it comes to market capitalization. But before we dive into the details on that news, let's just give a big picture overview because Coinmetrics has actually developed a number of supply metrics. Um, as far as I can tell, I think there are at least four. So why so many? What problem or problems are you guys trying to solve when it comes to the supply of blockchain-based tokens? Yeah, so it's it's a super interesting problem. And I think that one of the things that we're trying to overcome is that there are just numerous ways that blockchains can be analyzed and looked at and observed. And when the, the most transparent and the most obvious way to look at blockchains is just what's looking on ledger. So that's the very first supply metric that we came out with. And that's what we call current supply. And it's just all tokens that are that are observed from from looking at the ledger. And then once you start to understand that, you understand that that is not the most optimal way to look at the supply that's in the market, especially when you're considering indexes, which is a lot of what I do. And when you're looking to rebalance indexes, you're really trying to represent the real market, uh, the real market dynamics and the liquidity that's within the market. And that's a lot of the reason why we came up with free flow to kind of get a better understanding of what's available to market participants, which makes uh, makes managing an index or tracking a portfolio a lot easier for, for individuals. Uh, one of the third ones is the future supply. Um, so by looking at future supply, what we hope to do is we hope to have that forward looking view of how the market perceives uh, or how the market values the issuance of new tokens. Um, high inflation can lead to a depreciated value today. So, so we kind of look at what that future supply is to get a to hopefully reduce index turnover and, and index issues down the future by having that forward looking approach. Uh, so they're the three primary ones that we have. Um, yeah. And so now let's talk about the new metric that you announced this week, free float supply. Tell us about that. Yeah, so free float supply is it's a lot, it's a lot of work in the making and super happy to have it out in the public now and available on our community tools. But what we hope to do is again, there's there's no industry standard for supply across the market. And in traditional capital markets, it's very easy. You look on you look on Yahoo, you look on Bloomberg, you look in the newspaper, and there's just one supply figure everywhere you go. Um, with crypto assets, that's <laughs> that's up for debate, and that's anyone's guess at the minute. Um, depending on which data distributor you go to, you'll get a different value for the free float or the, the supply in the market. And what we hope to do was come up with a standardized methodology that can be applied across the plethora of crypto assets that are out there that very objectively looks at what the supply that's available in the market currently is. And the way we do that is we look at that on-chain supply, that current supply, and we, we subtract coins that, that belong to holders that we feel restrict supply to markets. And so, but why are you doing that? Like, what problem are you trying to address with this free float supply? Yeah, so the the key issue that we're trying to address or the key problem is that 
by, by having a better understanding of what's available to the market, um, investors can be more informed on what a, what a true picture of market capitalization is or, or index managers can have a better indication of how they should be weighting portfolios and balancing portfolios and allocating their, their dollars across assets. Um, because what you get is if you were to, for example, some of the, some of the ones that deviate most from their on-chain supply are ones like Ripple, Stellar, um, Crypto.com, where they have these huge issuances, but there's not, there's potentially between 15 and 30 percent that's actually available to markets to trade. So by having that disparency, uh, it makes it very hard if you if you take the bigger number if you're trying to allocate and, and weight a portfolio with that. So by looking at the by looking at the free float supply, you do get that better picture and you do get that better idea of how what the liquidity in the market is, and therefore you can make smarter investment decisions. And I should disclose that Stellar and Crypto.com. I I, I know that Crypto.com is a sponsor for this show. I'm not if. I'm not sure if Stellar was or it currently is, but it has at some point been whether or not that's still true. Um, and so, wh- when you calculate the free float supply, how do you what like what are you taking off the table when you do that? Like, wh- what do you subtract? Yeah, so the we're, we're subtracting big categories of investors that we deem again as those strategic long long term. Uh, long-term holders that aren't providing liquidity to markets. So the classical ones that we look at are the the foundations themselves. So in a lot of instances, foundations are known to hold a lot of tokens at the time of ICO or the time of issuance. Um, We're looking at team members. Uh, Going back through the team member wallets, it becomes evident that a lot of them do act as long-term holders. So therefore, we subtract their tokens as well. Um, We're subtracting tokens for... Uh, individuals who aren't uh, or who do hold the crypto asset without transacting it for over five years. So that's more relevant for some of the older older coins like Bitcoin. Um, we subtract, uh, I'd say they're the three primary categories and then there are some smaller categories. Uh, one that's particularly relevant to Stellar is we subtract lost tokens uh, or burned tokens. So for Stellar, for example, they burned I think it was around 55 billion tokens uh, within the last year, and that we wouldn't include in free float supply, but it's still visible on chain. So therefore, there's there's again a reason why why we look at the free float supply as opposed to on chain supply when looking at indexes and investability. And one thing that I found interesting is that it excludes some of the tokens that you say are provably lost. So how do you figure out if funds are provably lost? It seems, at least for some of them, it would be kind of hard to figure it out. Yeah, so there are there are very few tokens that do fall into that provably lost category. Um, it's not. Uh, it's not. I. It's not an individual saying, "Hey, I've provably lost my keys." <laughs> But it's more ones like the smart contract failures, like the Parity Wallet, uh, like the Parity Wallet hack, or like the Stellar Foundation, where they did send it to an an unspendable address. Um, so they're deemed to be provably lost, and I think they're the two biggest categories, or or potentially the only two categories of tokens that we consider in that provably lost. One of the other things we do apply to that is we do apply a minimum, uh, which I think is a it's a minimum as a percentage of the total supply. Uh, so that we're not chasing 0.2 Bitcoin that are provably lost in oh, right. somewhere. <laughs> but yeah, so what we what we did strive to do is we we with a lot of the methodologies and a lot of the categories of token holders that we do exclude, we look to leverage a lot of what's done in traditional capital markets, and and that has worked very well for us. Being and able to leverage that knowledge. Okay, and I actually just wanted to. I kind of break out a little bit more the differences between the traditionally reported supply versus the free float supply. And as you mentioned, so Bitcoin's is somewhat large 
um, probably simply because it was the first cryptocurrency. So I think a lot of coins were lost. You know, you hear those stories about people who decided to go dumpster diving to see if they could get <laughs> yeah. their hard drives. Yeah. Um, but that one, let's see. So it's typically said to have like 18.4 million coins, but the under free float supply, it only has 14.3. And the difference in market cap would be something like, you know, uh, we we might say like 160 billion, but in the table that Coinmetrics had in its chart, it, it was actually 130 billion. If you're using the free float, um, you know, as as you mentioned, also the XRP one was was really big. That one was 44 billion coins in the standard industry reported supply versus 30 billion in the free float supply. Um, that takes the market cap from 8 billion down to 5 billion. So that's like 30 percent less but the biggest one actually was bitcoin sv uh like the difference the standard industry reported supply was 18.4 million versus 10 million in the free float supply and i was just so curious like why is that one so large yeah so so what we did for a lot of the four coins was we look at this concept of what's being activated post fork as an indication of how many people are actually using the network or or how many people are actually providing supply to the network so if you look at Bitcoin SV and Bitcoin Cash, what we're trying to identify is which of the UTXOs have been activated or partially spent. Um, and that gives you an indication of how many people have actually claimed those tokens and therefore have the right to uh, have the right to be considered as, as sellers or suppliers uh, of BCH or BSV to the market. Okay. Uh, it's not to say that that won't change in the future if someone who holds or who held 50,000 BTC at the time of the BCH fork, or uh, it's not to say that they won't activate it in the future, but it's to say with the current knowledge that we have, this is our best guess, or this is the best estimation at what can be considered supply in the market. All right. So in a moment, we'll look a little bit more at that difference between the free float versus the traditionally reported supply when it comes to other coins. But first, a quick word from the sponsors who make this show possible. In this crisis, many investors aim to keep and grow their digital assets. Others seek to maximize the yield on their cash. Nexo allows you to achieve both of these goals. The company offers instant crypto credit lines against all major cryptocurrencies, with interest rates starting from only 5.9% APR. Nexo also allows you to earn up to 8% annually on your fiat and digital assets. What's more, interest is paid out daily and you can add or withdraw funds at any time. Get started at Nexo.io. Back to my conversation with Ben Sellermeyer. So one other one that was pretty interesting to me was Tether. Um, so for some reason, like in your chart, uh, in early 2019, the amount of Tether issue did not match the amount of Tether in the markets. Why was that? Yeah, so this is this was a super interesting finding that I learned as well. But what happens is when Tether mint new USDT, they don't necessarily issue it. So they've got their Tether treasury. And, and similarly, when, when Tether's out there and existing in the market, if people send it back to the treasury, Tether don't necessarily burn it at the same time it's sent back which means that there can be this big discrepancy between how many USDT is on chain uh, and minted versus how many is actually in the market because the Tether treasury holding it isn't a representation of what's, what's available and trading in markets. So that's what happened during 20, uh, 2018, 2019 is the Tether treasury started either either minting coins without issuing them or when it got coins back in the treasury, it didn't burn them. Okay, yeah. And so actually, then in that chart, it becomes pretty clear kind of how free float um, really uh, is, yeah, just kind of um, it's relevant for how the coin will trade because the graph then showed a correlation between the free float tether supply and the Bitcoin price, whereas the um, the total supply was, was not as correlated. So, like, why? And, and, yeah, why is that? It's just because it was the most liquid stable coin or? Uh, the correlation? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think that's for traders and, and speculators <laughs> to work out. But, um, but I mean, there has been a lot of research done around the, around the supply of stable coins in the market in, in relation to the price of Bitcoin. 
um, and especially as demand for stable coins increases, there's a lot of speculation that, or sorry, as supply increases, there's a lot of speculation that that means there's demand for a USDT on ramp so that people can buy Bitcoin. Um, so, like that speculation can hopefully be better informed by looking at the free float figures as opposed to the the on chain figures. Okay, and um, in the the same blog post where you introduced the free float supply, you also talked about some of these you know common valuation methods that do rely on uh, the market capitalization. And so the first one that you guys talked about was NVT ratio, which is the network value to transaction ratio. And that measures the total value of Bitcoin against the value transmitted through the network. So when you looked at that using the free float supply against the traditional market cap, what did you find? Yeah, so what we found was using using traditional market cap, you've got this natural appreciation of Bitcoin's market value just by virtue of uh, by virtue of the the issuance or the mining activity in in Bitcoin, uh, but that doesn't again if you're if you're looking at free float versus traditional market cap uh, or traditional crypto asset market cap, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the network's value is increasing if coins that are that are over five years old that haven't been transacted either aren't in the market or they're lost or for whatever reason they're they're just not being they're just not contributing to the trade. Uh, they, we found that by reducing those or subtracting those, it potentially gives slightly better signal and it gives you an, a, a better indication of what the true market cap is for the, for the asset class by which you can then measure a ratio of true market cap versus, or li- I won't say true market cap, but, but available market cap versus the, the transactions. Um, so for example, if you're, if you're trying to measure transactions today versus transactions a year ago, there are just more, even if transactions haven't changed, there are just more Bitcoin uh, that are being mined and more Bitcoin that are being created. So it does have that natural appreciation. So what we found is by having the free float, it hopefully gives you a better or a sharper indication of signal, especially in, I think at the minute, it's the over uh, the overbought region is where yeah yeah people sh- i'll include the uh link to this post in the show notes because you can easily see um the difference and i would say you know as we would expect that the difference does increase the o- over time so the more recent part of the graph is where that distinction's more clear and yeah um i frankly i you know i'm not a trader and um I I don't think the traders listen to my show very much. However, uh, looking at that, I was like, oh, yeah, if I were a trader, I definitely would probably prefer to use this metric for um, NVT ratio. Um, and then let's talk about the other one, the uh, market value to realized value ratio. How did that differ when you use the free float supply? Yeah, so so by a similar um, by a similar logic, you've got a market value that's that's perpetually increasing. Well, Assuming price stays constant, your market value just naturally increases given the inflation rate. And therefore, again, by looking at what's available to the market, you what we found was that you get a sharper signal this time on the on the under or on the on the buy side signal, where um, where we found that you you again have that natural appreciation in the metric and. By just looking at what's available to the market, you do potentially get a better indication um, of, well, looking historically of where where you could look at uh, opportunistic buy entries for for Bitcoin. So one thing I was thinking about is like a lot of these networks are looking, well, I should say the newer networks are looking to govern via tokens. And so those decisions could have an impact on things like the emission rate or lockups or whatever. So is your team just going to continually update these, um, th- this free float number for all these different coins? Like I just can't imagine, that must be so much work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, so we will, and we will look to expand, uh, expand our coverage of the assets. Um, one of the the neat things uh, for me, at least, working at CoinMetrics is there's no there's no shortage of uh, of skill or, or 
or no shortage of expertise in the team and what the team has been able to do, leveraging most of the the network data capabilities and the nodes we run and all the all the other metrics we run is there's there's real time monitoring of these addresses. So every time we get daily reports for each of the transactions in and out of any of our tagged addresses so that we can very, very much monitor just like have this laser focus on what the what the addresses of interest are and we can monitor the the inflows and outflows from those wallets and make assessments on the go as to whether they're just cold wallet shuffles, foundation wallet shuffles, team wallet shuffles, or or whether they are actually providing liquidity to markets by going to exchanges or or recently some of the interesting ones have been uh, <laughs> token movements to compound for for yield farming. <laughs> and activities like that but, not surprising yeah <laughs> um all right well so what new indices or financial products could you see making use of this free float supply metric or any of your other recently introduced metrics yeah so we hope to launch uh the cmbi 10 in the next uh i'll say month or two and what that will be is that will be our version of a top 10 uh weighted market cap and that will use free float so again we hope to better uh we hope to better represent the liquidity of the market through using this metric um but the metric will uh the metric is available for any index that does want to um to weight with free float as opposed to company reported or on-chain market cap. Um, yeah, that's what we hope to do with it. We just hope to provide transparency. We hope to provide a standard to the market. We hope to provide education so that so that users or, or participants of the crypto asset network can have that uh, or can have a, a, an informed metric that does follow a standardized methodology across across the crypto asset class. All right. Well, we will look out for that. Thanks so much for coming on Unconfirmed. Cheers. Thank you so much for having me, Laura. Don't forget to stay tuned for the weekly news recap. Stick around for This Week in Crypto after this short break. How much in fees are you paying for crypto purchases? Now, Crypto.com is waiving the 3.5% credit card fee when you buy crypto. Apart from crypto purchases, you can also get a great deal on food and grocery shopping with Crypto.com. Get up to 10% back when you pay with their MCO Visa card. No card? Use the Crypto.com app to buy gift cards for up to 20% back. Download the Crypto.com app today and enjoy these offers until the end of September. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to this week's news recap. First headline... PayPal and Venmo to launch crypto buying and selling. Um, you guys, so this was actually a story from last week. And due to a copy-paste error, yes, I know, that's kind of crazy. In my recap last week, I neglected to include, include this story, which was the biggest news story last week, um, which is, as the headline says, that PayPal and Venmo will be launching crypto buying and selling. Although it's not clear which tokens will be available, the service could roll out in as soon as within the next three months. All right, so now on to the headlines for this week. DeFi hacks continue with half a million dollars hacked from Balancer. The hacks in DeFi continue this week with another multi-protocol attack draining about $500,000 worth of tokens from automated market maker pools on Balancer. The attacker took out a flash loan of wrapped ETH on DYDX and swapped it for a so-called deflationary coin called Statera, ticker STA, which meant that there would be a 1% transfer fee charged from the recipient per transaction. However, the balancer pool did not recognize that with each transaction, it was receiving 1% less of STA. And the hacker made this transaction 24 times to drain STA from the pool and then used the last single one-way STA to get the pool to release more wrapped ETH and drain that pool. The hacker repeated this with WBTC, SNX, and LINK, the uh, wrapped Bitcoin synthetics token and uh, LINK for chain link tokens. And then because Balancer is actually giving out liquidity mining rewards right now, the attacker also obtained more Balancer pool tokens and then used to get even more wrapped ETH. Uh, if you followed all that, then good for you. <laughs> 
Um, so this actually was similar to the Lend F Me attack in that this stems from a certain type of technology being used in a system that could not account for that technology. And also what was similar is that this potential problem was actually flagged beforehand or known beforehand. Someone uh, had previously flagged this as a potential issue to the balancer team. In the end, Balancer decided to fully reimburse all liquidity providers who lost funds during the attack. Next headline. DEX's surging hit a new all-time high. Monthly trade volume on DEXs reached $1.51 billion in June, up 70% compared to May's volume, which was just shy of $900, $900 million. It's also up 46% compared to the previous all-time high of $1 billion in March. Uniswap and Curve led the pack when it came to DEX volume, although total DEX volume is still just 2% of the volume on centralized exchanges. The block also did a nice deep dive on DEX aggregators such as 1inch Exchange, Total, and Paraswap. Unsurprisingly, prices are best on the aggregators as proposed as opposed to single DEXs, especially for larger orders. And this week, the 0x protocol launched its own DEX aggregator, called Matcha, which I think is a really good name. All right, next headline. The Bitcoin stock to flow theory turns out to be nonsense. Well, the graph certainly looked credible. People may have heard of the stock to flow valuation model for Bitcoin espoused by the pseudonymous Plan B Twitter account. We mentioned it here on the show, such as in the Bitcoin halving episode and potentially also in the episode with Dan Moorhead, of Pantera Capital on Unconfirmed. In case you don't recall, the stock to flow theory says that Bitcoin has an un unforgeable costliness because it takes a lot of electricity to produce new Bitcoins. And that means that Bitcoins cannot be easily faked. It then posits that since there's a large supply of gold compared to the new supply introduced to it, that gives it a high stock to flow ratio and that Bitcoin's stock-to-flow ratio is about half that of gold's currently, but will someday be even higher. And that will eventually result in the price rising. So the theory seems to make sense, since we all know that the new Bitcoins minted with every block will asymptotically reach zero eventually. However, a few posts, including an op-ed this week by Nico Cordero, the chief investment officer and fund manager at Strix Leviathan, points out a fundamental flaw in the theory. There is zero correlation between the stock to flow for gold and its price. There's an extremely striking chart in the op-ed that shows this. In the op-ed, he says, quote, we believe the model's accuracy will likely be about as successful at forecasting Bitcoin's future price as the astrological models of the past were at predicting financial outcomes. Eric Wall, the CIO of Arcane Assets, pointed out, uh, or he wrote up a post chronicling all the people who determined the model was flawed. All right, next headline. Ethereans and investors beat the drum for EIP-1559. In his newsletter at the Daily Gway, Anthony Sassano of Set Protocol, ETHUB, and Into the Ether broke down how he thought that if Ethereum Improvement Protocol Proposal 1559 were passed, it would both improve the user experience on Ethereum as well as help ETH accrue value. First, EIP 1559 would make it less common for people to overpay miners' fees while maintaining the ability to skip ahead in line by paying a tip to miners. There's also a function by which the base fee is burnt so that only the tip goes to miners. Anthony breaks down how apps are currently parasitic on Ethereum. He, as he puts it, quote, their on-chain activity does not add fundamental value to ETH. What now happens is that the fee basically just goes back and forth between users and miners. He explains the cycle thus, quote, user buys ETH, user pays fee, miner takes fee, miner may sell the fee, ETH back into the market and cycle begins again. If EIP-1559 were to be implemented, however, since the base fee would be burnt, the rewards paid out to stakers in Ethereum 2.0 will be less than what miners currently make. And overall, that would have a deflationary effect on Ethereum since the issuance would be smaller than what is burnt. On a related note, 
Block Tower Capital's Ari Paul tweeted that he thinks EIP-1559 is make or break for Ethereum. He said the reason was because right now the main issue for Ethereum and DeFi is to get big fast, since the, pace is st- the space is still so small. And he said, quote, growth and ETH market cap, has to- market cap has to keep up with the growth in the market cap of tokens on Ethereum, or you incentivize a wide range of game theory attacks. Next headline, 500 BTC stolen traced to Zappo and Indodax resulting in lawsuit. A German trader named Dennis Nowak sued Bitcoin wallet provider Zappo and crypto exchange in Indonesia called Indodax after 500 BTC stolen from him, which was about 4.5 million at press time, were found to have been moved to wallets at Zappo and Indodax. As the block puts it, quote, while lawsuits arising from hacks and stolen funds are common in the crypto space, this one stands out due to the degree to which it relied on asset tracing. Firms like Chainalysis and Elliptic have developed proprietary systems for analyzing blockchain data, tracking the flow of illicit funds, and even identifying the individuals behind it. But they tend to cater mostly to exchanges and law enforcement agencies. The NOAC versus Zappo case suggests that crypto asset tracing may start making regular appearances in civil lawsuits too. All right, time for fun bits. First headline, daily transaction fees on Ethereum higher than Bitcoins for a record 26 days. Stephen Zhang, head of research at the block, tweeted a chart showing that Ethereum's transaction fees have only surpassed Bitcoins twice and the current streak is for 26 days and counting, which is a new record. He says that since the start of the streak, the average daily fees on Ethereum have totaled $791,571, while in Bitcoin, they've been at $341,430. Similarly, it turns out that the Ether options market has now reached the size of the Bitcoin options market in December 2018. All right, thanks for tuning in. To learn more about Ben and Coinmetrics, be sure to check out the links in your show notes. And don't forget, you can now watch videos of the podcast and of this weekly news recap on the Unchained YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com slash C slash Unchained Podcast and subscribe today. Unconfirmed is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Anthony Yoon, Daniel Ness, Josh Durham, and the team at CLK Transcription. Thanks for listening.